All right. So I'm going to go ahead and just do some of the introductions here, and then we will kick it off to our panelists. So again, welcome. This is Jen kovic bordnick I'm the CEO of the eHealth Initiative and Foundation. We're delighted you could join us for our webinar this afternoon on TEFCA. Let me give you a little bit of an overview about what we're going to be talking about today. We can get the next slide. Um, we're really fortunate to have three stellar um, experts and speakers joining us here today. We have Chantal Warzala, who's the VP of Health Information and Policy Operations at the American Hospital Association. Um, and we are also very fortunate that Chantal is the vice chair of our policy steering committee, which has been working um, really um, quite hard lately to develop our own eHealth initiative and foundation comments. Um, on TEFCA, and you'll hear about that a little bit later on. We also have Gerard Scheitlin here, who's the Chief Risk Officer and Global Vice President of Security of Risk and Assurance at Orion Health. Um, Gerard's done a lot of work um, studying these comments and looking at TEFCA over the last month, so we're delighted to have him here today. And we also have joining us Kelly Hoover Thompson, who's the CEO of the Strategic Health Information Exchange Collaborative, as many people know um, as Sheik. Um, we're delighted to have her here today as well. They've done a lot of um, great work around TEFCA and have their own comments letter as well. After we hear from um, the speakers and the panelists, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So I just want to give everybody a heads up on that. And Claudia, if you can skip ahead. All right, housekeeping issues. So everybody's muted right now, so we don't have to hear all the dogs barking and the doorbells ringing um, in the background. Um, but if you would like to make a comment or ask a question, um, please feel free to go ahead and submit one through that Q&A feature or the chat feature there in front of you. Um, we are expecting a lot of questions today, so the sooner you get your question in, the better. Um, we would be delighted to um, discuss it with the panel. If you have any technical difficulties, you can also do that through the chat box. Um, and all the slides, we're already getting questions about the slides. The slides will be available for download um, on EHI's resource page. So that's at www.ehidc.org backslash resources. And I believe the slides are up there already. For those of you who are not familiar with the eHealth Initiative and the Foundation, we are a convener. Our mission is really to convene industry leaders from all across the spectrum of healthcare to talk about best practices and figure out how do we transform healthcare through the use of technology and innovation. So we do all kinds of wonderful things like research, education, advocacy, great webinars and educational series like the one you're on here today to talk about um, different um, both best practices and policies and regulations that will impact the transformation of care. Next slide. This is just kind of a sampling of some of the wonderful organizations that we work with. If you're not currently a member of the eHealth Initiative, it's a great organization to belong to. Um, it gives you the ability to meet with payers, providers, labs, patient advocacy groups, um, clinician groups, um, really experts from across the spectrum who um, are interested in a lot of the same things that you're probably interested in if you're on this webinar with us here today. So I encourage you um, to join if you're not a member right now. All of our hard work um, and all the deliverables that are created as a part of our mission um, get placed onto our eHealth Resource Center, which is at ehidc.org uh, backslash resources. This is an incredible, um, great clearinghouse of information, um, surveys, interviews, um, podcasts, videos, reports. Um, it's a great place to go to look for information on new topics and interests such as TEFCA. There's a lot of information up there right now on TEFCA as well. Um, and the great thing about the Resource Center is it's not just us pushing out information. You have the ability to post things as well. So what I would invite you to do is if you have information on TEFCA, if you have a comment letter on TEFCA, please feel free to go to that website, upload it. We would be happy to post it. Um, we're trying to make sure that we're a forum and, and give people the ability to share information with each other. So I do want to encourage anybody who has information or would like to share something um, to go ahead and upload it there at the Resource Center. Next slide. 
Um, some of the topic areas that we're focused on this year um, at eHealth Initiative are value and reimbursement, technology and analytics, and workflow and the patient experience. And all of these align quite nicely with uh, the TEPCA conversation we're going to be having here today. But if these are areas that you're interested in, we do have work group um, pilots running, um, surveys running, um, so we would be delighted to have you join our efforts. And um, what would this be without a party? We, we always have to mention a party. eHealth Initiative always likes a good party. So we would like to invite all of you, if you're going to be at HIMSS um, in about two weeks from now, um, eHealth Initiative is going to be hosting our famous uh, cocktail networking reception, which is, always ends up being kind of like a family reunion or a college reunion. Um, so I encourage you to come to that. That's going to be on Tuesday night, 6.30 to 7.30 in the Lido Ballroom or room 3104 um, in the Venetian Congress Center. And, and we would be happy to see anybody there, bring your friends. Um, it's a great place to network and meet others. And I want to thank um, Orion Health, um, eHealth Initiative and the Foundation. We are a very, very small nonprofit, and we would not be able to do um, the work that we do, these educational programs um, included, without the generous support of organizations like Orion. And I think you're going to hear today from Gerard, um, and you'll see in the coming weeks, um, Orion's really has a wealth of um, information and expertise at their disposal, and, and we're really fortunate to have Gerard with us on the call here today. But I do want to thank them for their support and um, of our mission and of this educational event today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chantal, uh, the wonderful Chantal um, from American Hospital Association, who's also the vice chair of our policy steering committee and has really been really a star in this area. Um, probably knows everything there is to know about policy and TEPCA and um, kind of all in the ins and outs of it. So Chantal is going to um, take us through our panel discussion today and facilitate some of our questions on the back end. So Chantal, let me turn it over to you. Fantastic. Thanks, Jen, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. I'm going to very quickly go over uh, what TEPCA is and some of the EHI comments on TEPCA. Uh, as you all probably know, the TEPCA was part of 21st Century Cures, which was enacted by Congress in December of 2016. And there is a section of that act which is really focused on health IT and how do we move forward on interoperability and information sharing in healthcare. So while the um, goals of the 21st Century Cures Act had a lot to do with how the FDA operates. There was also a good chunk of the statute that addresses health IT. And for those who don't remember what TEFCA stands for, that is a trusted exchange framework and common agreement. And in specific, 21st Century Cures called on ONC to create or endorse a trusted exchange framework and common agreement. And it was understood in the 21st Century Cures Act that ONC would be building on what is already happening in the private sector. Congress really recognized the importance of information sharing, but also the importance of building on the exchange that is already happening rather than um, disrupting that exchange that is already building in the private sector. So there was a initial draft trusted exchange framework and common agreement that ONC put out. It had a set of principles and then it also had a set of over 100 specific uh, technical terms that would need to be met by those participating in what is a voluntary uh, construct to pursue a, a national level approach to sharing information. Comments did close earlier this week on February the 20th, so we'll um, ask our panelists to tell us a little bit about what they thought about TEPCA and also what's next. And next slide, please. Our comments uh, to ONC as uh, EHI were formed by the Policy Steering Committee, which is a multi-stakeholder collaborative. We have 
patient advocates, healthcare providers, vendors, those engaged in HIEs and technology companies that support HIEs, all coming together to consider what was in ONC's proposal and how to respond to it in a multi-stakeholder fashion. As you might imagine, that could entail at times some uh, significant negotiation uh, because there wasn't necessarily all common view, but we came to agreement where we could and forged some good consensus uh, across stakeholders. So some of the themes in the comment letter, which I know is available on the ONC website, were first that we agreed with the baseline fundamentals and the scope, this idea of a single set of rules to pursue more efficient uh, approach to information sharing and building on existing initiatives is all very important and the right direction to go. There is some concern um, to be sure that what is built is sustainable and is not overly dependent on federal funding and is in fact very independent from the federal government and is truly a um, private sector, public-private uh, initiative. And in addition, it's important in this that all stakeholders, including patients and caregivers, uh, be part of the process and have a, a voice in the governance process for what will become, we think, the nationwide health information exchange vehicle. There was a lot of discussion about privacy and security and the ways in which the proposal from ONC may uh, not quite align with existing privacy requirements and also, of course, concern about security and how do we ensure that information that flows through uh, this process would actually be secure. So I think our panelists will um, speak to a number of other issues, but wanted to give you an overview of the EHI comments and certainly encourage you uh, to read the comment letter for yourself. So with that, um, let me go ahead and turn things over to Gerard Schottlin and uh, really look forward to hearing his remarks. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Um, just wanna talk a little bit about, before we kind of get started, because I'm probably coming at this from a slightly different viewpoint than our other panels for sure, and maybe a lot of the people in the audience. If you go to the next slide, please. Orion Health is actually a technology vendor. We provide, right now, we provide HIE solutions and platforms for a number of HIEs in the U.S. and actually globally. We house about 120 million global records and about 50 million of those records are actually in our SaaS operations in the U.S. Um, we reside in AWS, we have Precision Medicine, and we're rather right, widespread and global, but we're the IT vendor that a lot of people use to actually drive through interoperability at this point in time. Next slide, please. So with that, you can see that kind of, you know, some of the things we work on, we have integration, we have interoperability, we do big data and analytics, um, population health management, and care management in the community and patient engagement. So just to kind of give an overview of what Orion does, because it, it gives a slightly different viewpoint as we went through TEFCA and looked at TEFCA from our side versus maybe some of the HIE side. Next slide, please. So as we went through, obviously, just like everybody else, we're definitely supportive of what the ONC is doing, where they are with TEFCA. I really think it aligned with that of Congress and the 21st Century Cures Act. I think Congress was disappointed with what meaningful use did for interoperability. I really feel like TEFCA, if we had created TEFCA before we kind of digitized the records and actually had established a framework first, I think we might have had a better option to go forward than we are. But not only, and not only are, do you have all of the healthcare benefits inside of this type of interoperability, but I also think that there will be some 
some stronger level security and privacy benefits that come out of it as this full longitudinal record is there. I really believe that it'll start to allow for better investigation of things like healthcare fraud. It'll create a, create a collaboration that needs to happen between the payers, the providers, the research organizations to actually drive through that. And really kind of one of the most interesting ones I think that you'll see happen. And I think you'll see it devalue the healthcare record on the black market. Right now, a healthcare record on the black market is worth, and numbers vary anywhere between $75 to $250, depending upon the research that you look at it, where a credit card record is worth about a dollar, primarily because of the fact that if your credit card record is stolen, it basically gets stopped pretty immediately. Nobody, you know, there's not a lot of loss to it. They know how to go investigate and attack. But how often has it been that somebody's actually called you up and said, or you've been able to go look and say, is anybody using my information for healthcare fraud? So I think you'll see that this actually has the opportunity to value the, your healthcare record on the black market because now it can't be used without that patient being there with it. So I think it'll create a more secure environment. Now we obviously have to get through getting to that point, which is kind of a lot of the concerns that are out there. Next slide, please. So some of the things that Orion Health looked at and, and think about, obviously one of the, some of our recommendations back into the ONC is patient consent and resolving around patient consent. When you look at patient consent and you've got the 40 CFR, 42 CFR part two and the sensitive data, the state to state consent models, um, the can, consent revocation management, et cetera, all of those things create a massive con consent model that is very difficult. And they really need to work to simplify this consent model and make it a nationwide single patient consent model that is easier to manage, easier to program, easier to handle everywhere from the QHINs all the way down to the participants. Um, they need to clarify the covered entity business associate relationship. Um, definitely some things around the timeline, not just the timeline of when TESCA is going to launch. The other concern is that you know, they want, as new standards come out, they want the new standard in place in 12 months. I think if everybody thinks about updating technology, particularly if it's a significant standards change, updating technology and spreading it out across the U.S. into all of the QHINs and everybody else to manage within 12 months is going to be difficult. So we recommended a time frame change on that. Um, patient matching, um, you know, They've based it on patient matching and certain patient matching standards out of meaningful use. I don't know if those are strong enough or tight enough, considering the volume that you'll have, particularly when you think about the bulk transfer process that they've called out in TESCA, to be able to truly ensure 100% match without something kind of completely different in that basis. Um, obviously, tying back to HIPAA and access laws and accounting of disclosures, um, we're just wondering responsibilities and who's responsible for ensuring and being able to report back who access a particular patient's record. And then security. I don't know if they went tight enough and far enough on security, particularly in the short term. I think they need to establish third party certification for QHINs. I think they need to say that we're going to require QHINs be whatever they pick. ISO, high trust, SOC 2, whatever they pick, but they need to pick something and say we're going to require QHINs are externally validated for their security. Um, they really didn't drive encryption requirements deep enough into it. You definitely need to make sure that you require encryption both at rest and in transit. And they really didn't go to those, those steps. And they also didn't attack the role-based authentication and authorization. Um, they went through it, but they really didn't say, when you think about access and who has access to records, it really needs to come from a role base so that certain people can access certain levels of that record, but not the entire record. So that's kind of where Orion came from as we went through and looked at TEFCA over the last 45 days. And with that, I'll hand it over to Kelly. Thanks, Gerard. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts with you all today, too. I will um, give the caveat here, uh, being the good lawyer that I am, and just note that I will not profess to be a TEFCA expert, um, but like Gerard, I will share my insights with you today and um, hopefully maybe prompt you to think about some things you hadn't considered before 
Uh, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A today as well. So next slide, please. For those of you who may not be familiar with Chic, uh, we are the Strategic Health Information Exchange Collaborative. We are a national nonprofit consortium of more than 60 health information exchanges. Uh, that's statewide, regional, community health information exchanges. We also have uh, strategic business and technology partners that work with us. So all in total, we have more than 100 members that work with the organization. We serve about 20 or 75, excuse me, 75% of the U.S. population. And I did provide our website there if you'd like to learn more about who we are. Our regional, statewide, and community HIEs connect providers, uh, pharmacies, radiology services, post-acute, acute, behavioral health, social services, all across the care continuum from disparate platforms. That's really the role that our chic HIEs play. As you can see there from the slide, we are the trusted uh, data trustee in our communities. We provide near real-time access to patient information and have been working in our communities for the past several decades to really find that comfort level to exchange information. Next slide, please. One of our uh, premier works is a patient-centered data home, and I would encourage you all to learn more about that. I'll just touch briefly on it today and share that it is our interoperability solution. Um, it is our cost-effective, scalable method of exchanging patient data amongst our health information exchanges. It is based on triggering episode alerts where we've identified a home HIE of a patient and an away or non-home HIE. It allows information to be shared between those two groups. Um, it really does support Sheik's vision that clinical information should be available whenever the patient needs it, where that information is occurring, and centered around the patient to improve his or her care. We currently have four regions that are working with patient-centered data home and almost 25 HIEs to date. Pretty fast uh, expansion for us, given that we've really just done the formal kickoff of patient-centered data home earlier this year. So we're very excited about this opportunity, and I'll talk a bit more about how we see this fitting into TESCA. Next slide. All in all, whenever we looked at TESCA, um, we always appreciate the opportunity to comment on things like this. Having been a former regulator, policymaker myself, it's always helpful to have industry comments and understand where we've gotten it right, maybe where we need to consider some further recommendations. And so it's always a good opportunity to have the chance to talk through, step back, provide comments. And so Sheik is very committed to interoperability. I mentioned the patient-centered data home before this. That's a prime example. You know, patient-centered data home really allows providers to see where their patient got the care, when they got the care, and who exactly that remote provider believes the patient is in terms of identity. So those pieces in and of themselves support interoperability, and we see Sheik as a partner and resource for ONC going forward. Like others on the phone, uh, we also submitted comments through the process and have received comments from many of our colleagues. I think that what Sheik has provided in terms of feedback and recommendations is very much in line with what I've heard from others in this space. One thing that we're very excited about, there was a specific question that ONC had asked about prescription drug monitoring and including that in TESCA. There were a few specific questions that ONC had asked, in fact, but this was one that we're pretty excited about. We're fortunate to have Deb Bass and the Nebraska Health Information Initiative as part of the Sheik family. They actually partnered with one of the Sheik Strategic Business and Technology members and have been able to exchange more than 4 million prescription records just since the beginning of this year. 
We've used the Nebraska Health Information Initiative as an example of the benefits of running prescription drug monitoring programs and HIEs together to share that information. I've listed just a couple of those benefits. The opioid crisis is, of course, on the top of mind for many folks. Running it through the HIE and working with the partners within that community we see of great value. And it's one of the areas that we really stress with ONC as a prime opportunity for us to see some benefits. Next slide, please. So after many webinars, conversations, scratching our heads sometimes, just stepping back, trying to digest TESCA uh, from the many webinars too that ONC provided, she came up with 10 key points in terms of our recommendations. The first one is to do no harm to the existing models that are functioning well. We've suggested that patient-centered data home is a example of that is a, a very nice model for ONC to look to and realize practical impact and delivery of successful results. We've also asked ONC to consider the cost burdens and the strict time, time constraints for coming into compliance with the QHIN requirements. I think this is one of the things that was probably most um, unsettling for me whenever I read through this, just having negotiated and drafted some of the agreements that are in place for exchange across different HIEs, those agreements take quite a bit of time to get into place. And when we're talking about expanding permitted uses and things of that nature, it just takes time. It takes time to socialize it, get people up to speed on what the practical impacts would be and find that comfort to reach an agreement that you can actually put pen to paper and get to be operational within the exchange. So we've asked for consideration around the cost burdens and the time constraints for operationalizing things of that nature. We've also asked that there be consideration for the RCE governance. Remember the RCE is that umbrella organization that ONC has proposed to um, be the overarching organization that oversees everything and works with ONC to do that. We found that it would be very important to make sure that there's fair representation, that it is conflict-free, and that there is a fair policy development process within that structure. So if the QHINs are reporting or have that contractual relationship with the RCE, which we assume will have some flow down provisions from the common agreement, then there really needs to be a fair representative process in place for people to participate and be part of that community. We've also um, asked ONC to consider the status of standards and interoperability today. And we've described that as beware of the shiny objects and don't let those distract you as you're going through. Give these standards today an opportunity to really mature and consider uh, what the impact of using those might be. So uh, just a quick note to recognize that some of the recommendations that I suspect people are providing are very much in line with this as well as we're still trying to navigate some of the benefits and maturation of these standards. We spent a fair amount of time talking with ONC about creating a national patchwork of privacy. There's a fair amount of conversation out there, and Gerard, I think, mentioned it to you as well, just in terms of the variation of state laws privacy. Um, there have been a significant number of work groups that ONC has brought together in past years, and we would encourage ONC to take a look at some of that prior work, taking a look at how HIPAA lines up with what the needs are today, looking at things like 42 CFR, um, considering state law variations for those privacy laws where um, you're considering how to exchange HIV and AIDS, mental health information along those lines. 
those are not easy things to tackle. And so having some leadership to crosswalk all of those variations would be very helpful. We've also asked ONC to consider a recommendation around federated batch or broadcast queries and that there may be a bit of a better approach around that. We've also asked ONC to take a look at how we might step back and look at this from a global perspective in healthcare so that we're not just looking at the framework itself, but also considering existing requirements like meaningful use um, and some of the social determinants piece that I know many of our HIEs are looking at. Several of our members are not just looking at the exchange of information. HIEs today are looking at data quality, analytics, and providing that next level of exchange services. And so it's important to consider that global picture um, and what architecture and security needs to be in place to provide that. I know Gerard spent a fair amount of time talking about security and we encouraged ONC to take a look again at that patient-centered data home model. Finally, um, the phased implementation, I think I did touch on that just in terms of the timing that really needs to be considered for the overall um, implementation period to operationalize this, and then the value of HIEs in our communities that are delivering results today. Overall, while we had recommendations for ONC, you know, we really wanted to be partners and to be seen as a resource in this. Sheik is committed to being part of the solution and in interoperability, and we're hopeful that the feedback that we have given uh, is helpful. So next slide, please. That's just my contact information. Uh, we do try to stay active on social media and share stories, uh, input, feedback from across the nation. Uh, we do have members from Alaska to Atlanta, New England, and everywhere in between. So it's always helpful to try to share information and keep the, the sense of the pulse across the nation as well. So that's all for me. I appreciate the time. I hope that was helpful. And I think now we're going to turn to Chantal for facilitation and questions. Great. Thank you so much. Some good perspectives. I see some overlaps between what uh, you both had to say and perhaps some differences. Uh, for the next 10 minutes or so, I think we'll have a conversation uh, among our speakers and then we will go to the audience Q&A. So if folks want to put their questions in now, um, that would be fantastic. Uh, but in the meantime, while folks are thinking of their questions, I have a question for both of you, which is really about the uh, question of stakeholder engagement. Uh, and I know, um, the AHA actually, as well as EHI, and both of you have pointed out this need for all stakeholders to be at the table and to be, for example, part of the recognized coordination entity governance. I wonder if um, you have other thoughts about how stakeholders can be engaged and ensure that the process is fair. Uh, and also, potentially, are there additional ways for stakeholders to weigh in with ONC um, as the process unfolds? I, this is Kelly. I can start that. Um, I think just a couple of quick thoughts. One of the recommendations that we made was that ONC consider um, future activity being done through a formal rulemaking process. I also think that there is an opportunity for stakeholders to talk with ONC going forward and amongst ourselves in this space. Many of us who've worked in this space for a long time, you know, have pretty strong relationships and it's always helpful to exchange ideas and information. I think that ONC has been very willing to talk with us through this uh, come to our organization. I know uh, Genevieve 
was open and she and her team came and presented to our members to try to talk through this. They posted many webinars. So I would anticipate as it unfolds, they will stay in line with that and stakeholders will have a continued opportunity to talk with them in that regard. Thanks. Yeah, I agree, Kelly. I think there are those opportunities. We recommended, there's a couple of things we actually put in our recommendations. The first one is, is we asked for them to come out with, as they've gone through this and continue to go through their listening sessions and everything else, and they've been really open with their listening sessions, and have taken a lot of what's been said back into TEFCA, um, is to come out with another draft TEFCA, not, try not to delay the end, but actually give everybody another opportunity to review and comment before it becomes finalized. Uh, the other thing is, is as you read the 21st Century Cures Act, the 21st Century Cures Act actually called out a need for a pilot program that really wasn't identified as we went through TESCA to understand what that pilot program looked like and how we could possibly pilot this to ensure that it was feasible, functional, you know, did everything that we expected it to do. So those were a couple of other things to be on the lookout for as you go through. And then even kind of from an Orion side, we're hooking into several of the organizations that are out there that are commenting and have tied in with the ONC and helping to pull together TEFCA. And I suggest you figure out one or two organizations that you can work into to either get your voice into those organizations or watch for the opportunities and address ONC directly either through their listening sessions or through their public comments. Fantastic. And, and uh, in case listeners aren't aware, there is the new Health Information Technology Advisory Committee, which is giving guidance to ONC and is currently um, looking at the TEPCA. While the public comment deadline was February 20th, the HITAC uh, is still considering it and I believe will be making some recommendations back to ONC in March. Uh, so folks could also potentially tap into that process, which does also um, provide for public comment and have public uh, meetings. So we have a lot of comments coming in. I'm just going to ask one more uh, question, and then we'll make sure that we get to a lot of the audience questions. My question is really about um, patient identity and the extent to which uh, the TEFCA addressed challenges with patient matching or did not address the challenges with patient matching. What are, what are your views on that? Well, I'll go first on that one because it was a big issue as we went through and looked. You know, there are definitely patient matching issues um, inside of HIEs you know, people have to resolve, there's data duplication, there is, you know, there's duplicate records out there. I don't feel like TEFCA addressed those in any manner that would make it comfortable that if you either opened up a patient record to see what it was, but that, you know, sometimes that's okay because you can sit there and talk to a patient and understand where there may be errors in the record. But if you think about the bulk transfer inside where you're out there looking for specific records to match certain criteria to do a bulk transfer, the ability for the patient matching and to ensure that you've pulled every record correctly for that individual um, was really kind of a frightening concept. I think that they need to take a strong look at this and hopefully they will take a strong look into either a national patient identifier or something to that nature. I know there's been some work um, overseas in some areas that are actually driving towards national patient identifiers, utilizing um, vendor technologies that are out there and available. So I, I don't feel like they addressed it significantly enough. They, didn't, they definitely didn't put any level of metrics or anything else to that nature that would set a requirement or, or a bar for the patient matching and patient identification. Kelly, anything you would want to add to that? Sure. I do think there could have been more around the patient identity and matching piece. Um, 
that said, when you're drafting these things, you know, it's always difficult to anticipate every single issue and every single perspective, which is why you have public comment process. Um, but that said, I would submit that patient-centered data home, you know, has solved this issue. We've talked for many years about getting a national patient identifier, and the neat thing about patient-centered data home is that it uses that local HIE to resolve the identity. And so it, it allows for the exchange of that to happen. And so, I, again, I really would use it as a model um, for us to consider. I would agree it would be helpful to have some more guidance from ONC in terms of what they're thinking and envisioning in that regard. I know there's been conversation about uh, just from a security perspective, you know, the hotbed of opportunity that could be for a hacker or cyber criminal to get a hold of that information. And so a lot of conversation around that piece could be had, yet it would be helpful to have some additional guidance. Fantastic. And a related thread that we're getting in the public questions is also about um, the, the identity proofing. So not just how are we matching records, but how are we identity proofing a person uh, and doing that authentication and what kinds of standards uh, are needed to do that. I know that the, the TEFCA has pointed to certain um, standards for this. And I don't know how technical we want to get, but is it your belief that um, we can come to agreement uh, for a single way to address the authentication and the identity proofing? This is Kelly. I, I will say, yeah, I'll, I'll take this one first. I mean, I think there can be a fairly quick answer, I guess, to this uh, to some degree, because I don't know that there's ever any one single cookie cutter way that every issue and interoperability can be addressed. And so I'm hesitant to say that, yes, there, there is this one, you know, ultimate solution for everything. So I'd ask us just to keep that in mind. Um, as I said earlier, there are still some pieces yet to be seen. I think the maturation of some of the standards that we're looking at, there, there still needs to be some evolvement happening with those. So specific to that, I think we need to let it unfold. There are some tools in the industry that are proven now and are working. Um, and so we've asked ONC to take a look at those and to be mindful of those as they move forward. That's uh, just my quick initial thought on that issue itself. Gerard? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think there's tools out there that do this and, and do the identity and authentication relatively well. I think that the standard that Tefka called out will have to mature some as it goes through kind of the, goes through this process. They'll have to mature it a little bit to ensure that they get it better. Um, they may need to take a look at what type of remote options are there for a patient to identify themselves as well. So I, I think there's some moves to it in the technology side, but I definitely agree there are in, there are a number of technical solutions out there that I believe will satisfy the initial phase of it in knowing that I actually provided the correct information to that person. That person actually identified themselves correctly. Great, so a lot of work uh, to be done there. Here's a, a question that maybe Gerard, you could answer first. Um, what can HIEs do today to best prepare for TUFCA? A very practical question. That's a very practical question. Um, I think a lot, and, and I guess it kind of depends, you know, and, and this is kind of, this is what the interesting part as you went through HIEs and what they were, and even listening to the ONC webinar last week, you, you tr trying to understand where whether an HIE in its stance would become a participant or a HIN, or whether they could elevate themselves to be a Q HIN, is what I think kind of what the initial um, HIE needs to look at. They need to understand where inside of TESCA and where inside of that model they fit. Where, where do they apply? Where do they fit? 
how can they be, are they large enough? Do they satisfy the requirements? Are they um, non-patient centric? So do they not have the patient relationship type of thing that would allow them to become a Q hen? Do they want to operate as a hen or a participant? I think the one of the issues in TEFCA is that the guide, the differentiator between a participant and a hen is it's really crossed over. There's not really a good um, differentiator, in my opinion. When I looked at it, I kind of felt like participants were covered entities, hens were business associates that really still had somewhat of a relationship with the participant. And then the Q hen was almost a conglomeration of hens that rolled into the Q hen. So it's really difficult, but I think that's probably the first place I would start as an HIE. And then I would understand what technology changes need to be met from either satisfying the common data set, which falls a lot along the CCDA requirements, um, satisfying the query capabilities. Can you do some of the query capabilities that are out there that need to be satisfied to either allow yourself to move into the QHIN or continue to be a HIN slash participant? Kelly, any additional thoughts to that? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, obviously, given our uh, primary focus of HIEs within Chic. This has been a, a very significant part of our conversation. And one of the things as basic as this sounds that we've shared with our members to do is to read the proposal. While ONC did a fine job of putting together, you know, slides, it's never enough to read the Cliff Notes version of a novel. And so don't be that student, you know, that gets caught not reading the entire rule and depending on just the Cliff Notes version. So in addition to just reading the rule itself, and that includes the US CDI that has been proposed and those versions over the next couple of years, We've also asked our HIE members to develop internal teams. Get together your TEFCA brain trust within your organization that needs to look at the agreements you have in place right now. Look at what your permitted uh, purposes are right now. Look at your PR team, community outreach, people who are educating consumers or patients within your community, the providers that you're working with. Consider all of those people that may be impacted by the changes that TEFCA is proposing and get them on board. Uh, we've also developed a crosswalk tool for our members that looks at what QHIN requirements are, you know, compared to what we are looking at today. Look at the services that you're providing. Consider what those changes um, proposed in TEFCA may impact you going forward. And so those are just a couple of things quickly that we've asked people to take a look at. Um, you know, understanding the US CDI data that you're exchanging and focus on today versus where you may be in 12 months, 24 months, or even into that third year, those are significant places for you to resolve before you can even get, I think, to steps three, four, and five. So. Some basic pieces I realize, but if you don't have those initial building blocks in place, you'll be ineffective moving forward. Thanks. That's great advice. We have a number of questions coming in about these uh, new vocabulary words that we all have now. Uh, the idea of a QHIN or a Qualified Health Information Network, which seems to be some sort of um, uh, coordinating HIN that would actually work across existing or, or new HINs, and this notion of a, an RCE or a recognized coordinating entity that would serve really a, a governance function for the entire health information exchange uh, apparatus and really have um, organizational roles, have enforcement roles, have governance roles, and strategic roles. So it's quite an important organization. We have a lot of questions coming in about how do we think about the existing health information exchange entities that are out there and either mapping them 
uh, to these new roles or thinking about um, where there may be gaps between the entities that currently exist and what ONC has envisioned. You know, people have brought up exchange, uh, exchanges such as Commonwealth or some of the vendor-based uh, exchange mechanisms as well as the state HIEs. People have also brought up things like carry quality, which is really a trust framework. How do we, how do we think about um, migrating from where we are today to what ONC has laid out? I'll take that first, um, Mrs. Kelly. I would echo much of what I said in response to the last question. You really have to assess where you are today and what you're providing, what those agreements look like, what your communities would be comfortable with and sharing. Um, if you are members of some of the networks that you have mentioned, you know, make sure you have an understanding of, of where they are on it. If you are part of an organization and you have not participated in their comment process or taken a look at the final comment letters that have been submitted, that will be important for you to do to understand and assess where you are today again, is the building block to allow you to move to whatever that next proposal may be. Um, I think also it will be important for us to see what the RCE requirements are gonna look like. I would anticipate ONC has said they'll be out this spring, so I would say within the next few months, we'll see more from that RCE framework. Um, and then I would anticipate based on those requirements, we'll see much of that translated into the common agreement and flow down provisions that would have to um, be within those agreements as well. So I know that that was kind of a big question with a lot of pieces from definitions to networks across the board. I'm not quite sure if that's totally asked, answering the questions that have been asked. Um, so Gerard, happy to hear if maybe you have a different perspective on this. No, I do think that reading and going back kind of to what we said the first time and the previous question makes sense. The one thing to note is that in the public comments for TEFCA, one of the, one of the questions that was asked is what does an RCE need to look like? You know, what requirements are there for an RCE? So they actually reached out for public comment to help draft the RCE requirements, which is why they're coming out a little bit after TEFCA, which is really good from an ONC perspective. It shows that they're really trying to figure out what would make this work. Um, you kind of have to head back a little bit to the purpose of TEFCA. You know, TEFCA's comment is that there is over a hundred different networks that are out there that cost physicians money because they have to join them all. They have to be members of Care Quality, of Commonwealth, of Sequoia and He Health Exchange, and all of these others that cost, you know, it costs the provider money to join these. And they're trying to guide it to single on-ramp to interoperability. So I don't know where it's all going to land itself out with all of these um, different arenas and different um products that are out there and different networks that are out there it's going to be kind of an interesting business conflict in my mind as we watch this grow forward so i think the reality is is what kelly said is you really just have to become involved in what either the network that you're in and their comments and how they're viewing tests and which way they're going or within your own organization what you feel your organization likes dislikes um, is willing to adopt or not adopt for TEFCA as it moves forward. Great. Let's um, change direction just a little bit. And we had a question about APIs, which are, of course are application programming interfaces. And part of the TEFCA did suggest that we could move in the direction of using uh, open APIs for data access for all permitted purposes. Uh, is that something that you think is feasible and doable in the short term, or, or what are your thoughts on that? I'll kind of go first on this one. I don't know if it's feasible in the short term. I think it's something that is one of their long-term goals. It is one of the ONC's long-term goals. The ONC's long-term goal and kind of what started to drive TEFCA 
was the ability for a patient to walk into a doctor's office, open up their cell phone or their iPad or whatever and go, here, doctor, here's my complete medical record, and this is what I have going on. Tell me what's, tell me what's happening. Um, you know, they also want to make sure, particularly since the 21st Century Cures Act did a lot of deregulation for um, clinical data systems and clinical data analytics, the, some of this data that the data is available for physicians to use and run through analytics tools to help make decisions and help drive kind of some of the clinical decisions that go on inside of a provider's office. So I think when you head back to that, that's where they're headed with the open APIs. I did have a conversation with Genevieve, and her comment was that right now they are looking at read-only APIs. They're not looking at write APIs, which from a security side made me breathe a whole lot easier um, because I really didn't need people writing to anything that I was sitting there trying to house. Um, you know, but reading from it, I think those options are there. I know that we have solutions and products out there that work now and that there are products and solutions out there that work to actually drive through um, and can access medical records through APIs. It's just a matter of having enough of the data behind it to make it really a worthwhile application. So, so it's I'm Kelly. Gonna... Oh, go ahead, Kelly. Yeah. No, well, I was just going to say having the data available, I think, is key to making this robust and helpful. And again, you know, I I know I keep coming back to this patient-centered data home model, but it is patient-centered data home for a reason. And so many of the conversations on the health policy side, you know, we, we sit at these tables and we talk about the triple aim and even the quadruple aim and precision medicine and patient engagement and all of these buzzwords. But if we're really going to move the needle, really going to make a difference, the data needs to be available to support patients whenever they're getting care, wherever that may be. And to do that, you need the data to flow. I think open APIs will develop as we move forward. I would agree with Gerard that I think it's a, a longer term vision. Um, there's more to develop in that regard, but you need the data to make this fruitful. Yep, agree. Fantastic. So I think I hear a lot of um, agreement about the need to sort of phase and stage. Uh, a lot of good ideas in the TEPCA, but per perhaps a little bit more than we can accomplish building from where we are today uh, without some phasing and staging. Um, Jen, I see that we have three minutes left and just wanted to check in and see if you had any um, closing thoughts or if we could do one more question. Yeah, I think there are a lot of questions actually coming in regarding TEPCA and the impact on um, care quality or Commonwealth. Um, it'd be great to hear the panelists comment on that. Yeah, I, you know, again, and kind of like I said previously, I don't know what the impact is going to be. Um, I, and it's kind of interesting because in the ONC meeting, and somebody asked questions about consent and kind of consent management and, you know, driving maybe a nationwide consent model and other things of that nature. Um, I think Genevieve slipped and made the comment that she was hoping care quality would be able to do something like that in the near future. Um, but again, I don't know where their head is with all of this. Um, I think it's going to be, as I said, I think that I mean, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in competition. I'm a firm believer in having the competition of the networks out there. I'm scared TEFCA may try to reduce some of the competition that is out there because I think it drives innovation, it drives improvement, and it drives people to be better. So, but I'm not sure where those projects are going to end up. And I think a lot of it will depend upon the organization that rises to the top as the RCE. Kelly, how about you? Do you think there would be any impact on, you know, the programs like Care Quality, Epic's every, uh, Epic Care Everywhere, Commonwealth, et cetera? I think um, everyone in this space is trying to figure that out, right? Everybody could pull out the crystal ball, um, but I think we're all trying to assess where we are and brainstorm about what the impact may be. I can share that 
you know, we, we work closely with folks at, at Sequoia. I met with Commonwealth leadership this morning. Um, so we're all talking. We're all trying to figure this out. Um, and I think the, the best thing I could say to close is that we're here. You know, we stand ready to try to help LONC and others try to figure this out. I do think there will be an impact for all of us not one of us, I don't believe, given today where we are, could walk into a 100% cookie cutter approach with what has been outlined. I think every one of us would have to step back and evaluate what might need to change or be enhanced. Yeah, no, and I'll agree with you on that, Kelly, because I think, it, I mean, it applies not just from your side, but I think from the technology side, some of the things that Tessa calls out and is asking for, there's going to be a need for uh, technology development. To drive through some of these, some of these changes and some of these systems that are needed to go satisfy the TEFCA requirements. So I think on both sides, not just from an HIE and an organization side, but I think from the underlying technology and architecture, there's definitely got to be some work done as well. Which is some of the things Orion is working on with our vendors and our clients as well. Hey, Chantal, do you want to say anything to close us up? Uh, I think I would simply end by saying um, ONC asks for comment for a reason. They want to get folks input. So I don't think we can assume that the draft TEPCA that was put out uh, is where things will end up. And I think it is important for everyone who's engaged in this space uh, to continue to be engaged in the conversation. That's a great place to end it. Well, I want to thank our facilitator today, Chantal, and our panelists, Kelly and Gerard, for joining us. And once again, thank um, Orion for their generous support of the session today. And thank you, everyone in the audience, for joining us. We had a lot of great questions. Um, we will try to get back to those. Um, I think we had several that we weren't able to answer. So we will try to get back to you on those questions. So thank you very much for joining us, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Thank Dan. you. Thanks.